All right, um, so it's 11, so we will get started. Um, just a reminder to my presenters to just stay muted um, until it's your turn to present, but um, let's, let's kick off the presentation. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's Asian Carp Canada webinar series. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Liaison at the Invasive Species Center, where I manage our Asian Carp Canada program, and I'll be your moderator to, for today. And before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Robinson here on Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of Garden River First Nation, Batuana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a lot of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and a lot more. So check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can also check out our Asian Carp Canada website, which has some great resources and was just recently uh, revamped. So feel free to check that out. We have a ton of great re resources as well, including our webinar series, uh, species profiles, risk assessment summaries, and some information on prevention and monitoring techniques and way more. So uh, be sure to check that out at www.asiancarp.ca. And before we get started with today's webinar, there's a couple things I'd like to mention. So we will have time for questions following the presentation. So if at any time during the talk you have a, a question, just type it in the question box and I will read them out loud following the webinar. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can use the question box to uh, address those as well or just respond to your registration email which will uh, send an email to me and I'll do my best to resolve it for you. And lastly, there will be a very brief uh, survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. Um, it will help us out with a lot of things in developing the series for next year. So um, please fill that out if you can. And now for our presentation. Um, today's webinar is gonna focus on the Asian Carp Canada program and how we collaborate to raise awareness about Asian carps. And this webinar will be presented by myself, Colin Love from TRCA, Terry Reese from FOCA, and Brooke Schreier from OFAH. And we will also have um, Alex from DFO and Jeff from MNRF on the line. So if you have any questions related to the work that they do with the program, um, they're available for questions at the end as well. And now I will introduce um, our speakers, which is, I've never done this before, but I'll be introducing myself. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Rebecca Schroeder. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Liaison at the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, where I've worked since 2016. Uh, I received my honours degree in biology from Algonquin University in 2015, and at the Invasive Species Centre, I'm kind of the go-to for aquatic invasive species, and I manage our Asian Carp Canada program, which uh, utilizes digital tools to raise awareness about Asian carp. We are also joined by Terry Reese, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations since 2004, which is the largest waterfront landowner organization in Canada, representing 50,000 member families and 520 community associations. Terry has a BA in Economics from Western University and a Certificate in Environmental Management from Ryerson University. He is a member of the Trent Source Water Protection Committee, the Ontario Biodiversity Council, and numerous other committees. And he has been a member of NALMS for over 15 years. Terry is focused lead in Ontario's Lake Partner Program, the largest volunteer water quality monitoring program in Canada, and has volunteered on lake associations and with the environmental initiatives for over 30 years. Next is Colin Love. Colin has been a leader in the environmental education field within the greater Toronto area for almost 20 years. He currently leads Toronto and Region Conservation Authority's community learning team in Toronto including the animation of Tommy Thompson Park, Leslie Street Spit, and the Meadow Way. Colin is the Executive Director of the Green Neighbors Network of Toronto, the founder of Secondhand Sunday, and a partner with Brooks Love Big Picture. He completed his MED from York University with a research focus on ecological literacy, social media, and teacher training. He earned his Honours BSc from the University of Toronto and his Bachelor of Education from Queen's University with a specialty in outdoor and experiential education. Colin is a husband and father of two who, big surprise, loves to spend, out time, spend time outdoors with his friends and family. 
And last but not least is Brooke Schreier. Brooke is the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program out of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. In his five years with the program, he has worn many different hats, but his work has focused on aquatic invasive species outreach and education, including Asian carps, surveillance and monitoring for invasive species via the early detection and distribution mapping system and the invading species hotline. And he verifies accuracy of sighting information for aquatic and terrestrial invasive species so that any new detections can be reported to provincial and federal partners. He has his master's in sustainability studies from Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. So thank you so much to um, our speakers and to Jeff and Alex from DFO and MNRS for joining us today. And let's get started with um, the presentation. So again, uh, the title of the talk today is Asian Carp Canada, a collaborative approach to education and outreach to prevent the establishment of Asian carps. So just a little overview of our talk today. Um, I'm gonna go into an overview of Asian Carp Canada and mention some of our partners and, and what they do. And then um, each of our speakers will give an update on their organization and the work that they do specifically. And then we will open the floor up to some questions. So what is Asian Carp Canada? Asian Carp Canada is a program of the Invasive Species Center and all of the other um, organizations you see listed here. It was created to bring together information on the most recent prevention technologies, early warning measures, response efforts, and just the overall threat of Asian carps to the Great Lakes and beyond. So the project components aim to enhance education and knowledge of Asian carps, and we do this in partnership um, with many different agencies across Ontario, and you can see that big list of partners there. So we all work together with the shared goal of protecting the Great Lakes from Asian carps. So here's a couple um, highlights of, of our partners. So we work with the Toronto Zoo, and they have a really great exhibit, um, which hopefully this little clip plays. You can see some of the fish swimming around. Um, they do some classroom education outreach, social media campaigns, and um, a lot of other cool stuff. So that's just a little snapshot of the exhibit. It has three of the four species of Asian carps. It has big head, um, black carp, and grass carp, no silver. We also work with the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, and they have a fish identification course that includes information on the four Asian carps. They have an exhibit in there um, at the museum and they offer special programs as well. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry shares responsibility with DFO for surveillance and response to Asian carps on the Great Lakes. Surveillance led by the MNRF focuses on early to, um, environmental DNA to complement the traditional netting and electrofishing conducted by DFO. Environmental DNA is a powerful tool for detecting species that are present at low abundance. And while DFO leads the response to live Asian carps in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes, the MNRF is available to assist when needed. And Fisheries and Oceans Canada, um, they have a four pillar program to their Asian carp program. Um, the first is prevention, which focuses on outreach, research, and risk assessment. Then next is early warning, which is their early detection surveillance. Uh, then third is response, which is analysis, advice, action, and then lastly is management, which is regulations and pathway management, and of course science uh, informs every aspect of this program. And again, we do have uh, representatives from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Fisheries and Oceans Canada on the line for questions, so if you have any related to their work with the program, uh, please feel free to ask those as well. I did want to mention very briefly before um, the partners kind of get into their um, updates that we did do a gap analysis study that was led by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which kind of focused on all the communications efforts by the partners and looked into what we could do to more effectively uh, communicate our message. And we identified that we have three primary audiences and that we need to continue to reach the main audience of anglers, but focus on increasing that knowledge. And it emphasized the greater need for collaboration amongst the partners. So I will now give my update on the Invasive Species Center's Asian Carp Canada program. So our components of the program are the website. We manage the web page and update it with new web pages and just any other small updates annually. So this year you can look for um, some new pages on the ecological impact, economic impact, and as well, we'll be doing like a little test your knowledge quiz stage 
that encourages people to test their knowledge and share the results with friends and hopefully we can get as many people educated as possible. We also host public information sessions and we typically do these in person in high risk areas around the Canadian Great Lakes, but uh, obviously this year we've had to shift things and, and do things virtually. So we will be having our second session of the year on March 3rd and you can check out our website to sign up. It'll focus on Canadian research, which will be really interesting and I'm pretty excited about it. So um, please sign up if you're interested. We also, of, co of course, host the webinar series, which um, you're all listening to now. So we do anywhere from three to four a year and we get presentations from experts in the field. Um, and we give updates on things like outreach, biology, prevention, response. So uh, we have the full series on our website and you can check that out as well. We also host a response database, which is an inventory database for use in the event of a response effort, um, which is used by different link units across the province. And um, the main thing that I think we do is our digital awareness work. And I wanted to kind of focus in a little bit more on those individually. So we use social media a lot. Um, and this is just one example of a campaign that we've run. And, and we did this in partnership with Federation of Ontario Codgers Association and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. So this past summer, we hosted a joint campaign that focused on the ecological impact of grass carp. And each of the organizations kind of took a different approach. So we focused on how grass carp would impact different bird species that depend on wetlands. FOCA focused on water quality and how it might impact cottaging. And the OFAH focused on um, different sport fish and how it could impact angling. So we each kind of took uh, a turn each week posting on one of these three topics. And some of us boosted all of the posts, some of us didn't. So there was some advertising dollars behind them. And overall, we had 363,000 impressions, which we did a campaign last year, just um, the Invasive Species Center and the OFAH. And these numbers were increased by 22%. So. We, we learned a lot and we applied that and we had a really successful campaign this year. And you can also see that um, across the last seven campaigns that we have run at the Invasive Species Center just with social media, these two red bars here indicate uh, joint campaigns and you can see just the success of them compared to the ones that we've done on our own. So it's really great to collaborate with our partners, um, share some information and, and brainstorm together and we really do see the success of these campaigns. More recently, we've also used um, different digital awareness tactics, including influencer marketing. And this was kind of a result of the gap analysis that I mentioned earlier. It was one of the recommendations for different ways to reach our target audience. So uh, last year and this past year, we utilized an, an influencer, which um, is definitely new and, and exciting. So we worked with Ashley Ray um, and her handle on social media is She Loves to Fish. She has almost 90,000 followers across all of her platforms. So we worked with her last year and this year as well. And this year what she did was she did four posts on each of her platform plus a blog on her website. So that's just a little snapshot of the impressions that she received across her platforms. And in total, we, we got about 80,000 impressions, which was an 88% increase from the 2019 campaign that we did, which was really awesome. Um, and it's, I think, a great way to engage our audience. We do use social media and you can be really specific in how you target um, the people that you want to see your ads on social media, but we get a lot of different engagements, I find. And with influencer marketing, we know that the people that followed Ashley are people that are really interested in fishing and they really care about protecting the Great Lakes. So um, she got a lot of positive engagement and people were really interested in the campaign, which is really great to see. So looking forward to doing more work with influencer marketing uh, in the years to come. And this is just an example of a couple of posts she did. So she uh, actually posted the, the new grass carp video that Fisheries and Oceans Canada put out. And she did this new fact sheet that we have developed um, as, a, as, a, as a group. We worked together to create this new fact sheet on how to identify grass carp and the steps to take if you, if you think you've got one. So we had her post these and um, it's just a great way to reach our target audience. Another um, result of the gap analysis was to reach anglers in a different way through apps and websites that they might typically um, use already. So we worked with Anglers Atlas, which is a, a website and an app. And what we did was we utilized their email distribution list. So we sent out a feature newsletter to over 40,000 Ontario subscribers. 
And this means that this email that went into their inbox was completely specific to grass carp. Uh, last year we did this as well and we kind of did an intro to the four species, but this year we're really focusing more on grass carp specifically. So we got to do uh, just a feature newsletter with all this info on grass carp. And then we also did two email announcements. So just little tiny blurbs that we placed in their pre-existing newsletters. Um, and we got a lot of traffic back to our website when we did this. We saw spikes in page views on those days, which is really great to see. And then we also have this kind of clickbait, um, pun intended, uh, advertisement on their Great Lakes pages, except for Lake Michigan, because it's Canadian focused, of course, um, that if you click on, we kind of wanted to pique people's interest. Have you seen this fish? Have you seen a grass carp? Um, people would maybe be like, what's the big deal? So they'll click back and it takes them to uh, reporting information, identification information, and they can learn about grass carp on our website. And we get quite a few impressions with that as well. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Terry to talk about the work at uh, FOCA. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, and uh, we're really pleased to be a part of this collaborative effort to um, educate and bring awareness about Asian carp to uh, the people that we reach. So a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that's been around since we're all about thriving and sustainable waterfronts. So that's uh, been our role for the last uh, 50 plus years and uh, invasive species being a very topical and very important issue for all of our members. Uh, next slide. So as I said, we've been around a long time. We've got about 500 uh, member associations located from Kenora to Cornwall. Uh, they represent uh, collectively about 50,000 member families. Uh, so these are people that uh, many of them multi-generational people that have a long uh, history, have lots of eyes on the waterfront and who are uh, keenly interested in the state of our environment and the threats to the environment. Many of our members are on Ontario's inland lakes, uh, of which we have many, and of course, many uh, also located on the Great Lakes. And those people in particular have uh, uh, got a direct interest in uh, the introduction of carp, uh, uh, carp for sure. Uh, next slide. So this is our mission, and uh, this is what we do. We represent waterfront property owners and waterfront communities, and we do that through education, communication, and, and by uh, communicating with government and policymakers. Next slide. So the messages we've been sharing, uh, I've been in collaboration with the Invasive Species Center and others are about uh, the triple threat, I guess, the physical threat uh, that uh, CARPs um, uh, present, the ecological threat and the socioeconomic threat as stakeholders in our waterfront communities uh, on many fronts, uh, we're gravely uh, concerned about the uh, impact of all invasives and the CARP uh, being a particularly uh, uh, important one. Next slide. So we've uh, had information available through our website, foca.on.ca, uh, on many uh, topics, and we've had dedicated resources there. Mo much of it shared uh, resources from this collaborative uh, specific to Asian carp, and that's a site that we refer people to regularly as part of our communications, and I'll mention I'll mention some of that. Uh, in my remarks in a minute. Next slide. Uh, one of the primary ways we communicate with our members across the province is through our uh, e-alert, our e-newsletter. That goes to about 10,000, 11,000, close to 11,000 subscribers now across Ontario. So we send uh, those out on a regular basis to, uh, to people that uh, are both our members, people that are interested in the waterfront uh, experience, uh, policymakers, partners, and others. So we did, uh, we included an Asian carp reference in at least four of our e-alerts through uh, the last season. And there's a couple of them here. I'll just go through quickly, uh, Rebecca. So uh, not only do we get to speak directly to our members and uh, their extended um, memberships but we also are encouraging our members in their own rights to communicate through their channels to the members so we like to provide links and information so like the isc or the invasive species center does we want to have people pick up the information and use it for their own purposes and then in their own uh, venues and newsletters so that's one of the themes that we uh, continue to encourage and to use this year about asian carp next slide
Yeah, so we, uh, of course, are focusing on uh, the m many impacts that uh, carp can have. If people don't really know, understand the difference between uh, different species of fish and, and why these ones are a particular concern, uh, we want to spell out some of the um, spell out the spell out some of the specific impacts that they can have. And since water quality continues to be a top issue amongst uh, people that live on the water in Ontario, uh, these are some of the things we wanted to highlight to uh, make sure they understood uh, where carp uh, figure into the equation. Next slide. Again, uh, talking about uh, the importance of wetlands and how uh, carp can impact there and in, impact uh, the nutrient cycle. Our members are very concerned about eutrophication and uh, and the impact of uh, phosphorus on water quality. So another another theme we wanted to hit in our e-alert. Next slide. And I guess finally, we talked about, uh, again, impacts to water quality uh, sort of more broadly. Uh, the impacts uh, that the carp can have on uh, uh, in nutrient cycling and, and algae in our, in our lake. So those are all things that we uh, were speaking to in terms of the ecological impacts and, and things that we thought would resonate with our members uh, using, again, the re shared resources that are available through this collaborative. Next slide. Uh, we use a number of uh, the social media channels, of course. I think we did about, uh, check my numbers here, about 20 tweets and retweets uh, related to Asian carp throughout the season. Many of them shared uh, across our various uh, collaborators and some that are more specifically targeted to waterfront property owners, but that's uh, an avenue that we that we like to use and that we think is, uh, is a place where a lot of people get their information. So we're, we've been taking advantage of that wherever we can. Next slide. Uh, we feature a newsletter that goes directly to the executive in our in our in our member associations every year. So we've featured uh, an article again this year. So that's again talking about the impacts of Asian carp, and we are encouraging people to pick up this article or pit, uh, parts of it or aspects of it for their own communication. So that uh, Lake Stewart's newsletter is mailed every year to our to our members. Next slide. Uh, we're also using these uh, Asian carp identification cards, and then we're mailing those uh, to to our members when they're renewing their membership with us. So these are identification cards that are uh, that are durable, that can be carried, and uh, so people can have access to that in their pockets when they're out on the water, when they're fishing, boating, etc. So that's been uh, directly mailed to our member associations. We think is a is a helpful and handy reminder. Next slide. We did some uh, paid uh, posts, as uh, as Rebecca mentioned. We also posted uh, um, a number of things, uh, at least a dozen times, just through our, our regular Facebook posts. But we also did some paid advertising, which we thought had tremendous pickup. Uh, it meant we got across uh, to different audiences and, and beyond the people that were just friends and, and followers of, of us on our Facebook page, but that we found that was a, quite a productive way to engage a large number of people uh, and again many that uh, maybe we wouldn't otherwise have been able to reach with this messaging. Next slide. So we don't meet in person uh, anymore these days but uh, we've certainly featured uh, Asian carp as uh, part of our in-person events. We haven't had uh, Mr. Carp or whatever we call this guy at an event recently but certainly we've uh, had uh, an opportunity to feature uh, in different and fun and very visual ways, uh, the impact of carp and, and just a, a way to get people talking about this. So uh, so we've had our friends at OPP talking uh, with us about invasive species generally and the boating pathway. Um, and we had them pose at least for this position. So we thought it would be useful to have some people with side arms uh, expressing their displeasure in, in Asian carp. So just a little bit of fun to try and get uh, people's attention. Next slide. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Again, we're pleased to be part of this collaborative. We appreciate all the work that goes on uh, by the official agencies of uh, Fisheries and Oceans and MNRF and, uh, and the leadership of the Invasive Species Center. And we look forward to working together on these important issues as we, uh, as we move ahead. And so we can target uh, the audience that we reach with these important messages. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Next, I'm gonna pass it over to Colin. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, 
My name is Colin Love. I'm a, a supervisor with the education and training team at uh, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And similar to Terry, uh, we're, we're very much pleased to be a part of this uh, fantastic uh, collaborative. Um, you know, for today, I'll be pretty brief, but just going to talk a little bit about uh, the invasive carp, uh, grass carp that, that, that was found back in 2015 um, within Toronto Waterfront. A little bit about the approach that uh, Toronto Region Conservation Authority or, or TRCA uses to monitor um, fisheries in, in our region, as well as uh, a real focus, obviously, on the outreach and education side, um, which is uh, obviously the focus of today's uh, presentation today. Um, quick note, I mean, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, for those who aren't familiar, there's 36 conservation authorities across the province, and um, TRCA is one of them, and, and really our jurisdiction is looking after the, the nine watersheds within the Toronto region, as well as the, the Lake Ontario waterfront. So we can see the, the connection, certainly, to uh, to, uh, to this important work. Um, next slide, please, Rebecca. Thanks so much. So like I said, um, you know, no big surprise. Many of you probably uh, are familiar with this, but in 2015, there were five grass carp, uh, carps found within the, the Toronto waterfront. Uh, there were two females, um, or pardon me, two males found in uh, July two, 2015, kind of around the Tommy Thompson Park area, which is uh, also known as the Leslie Street Spit. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, the Toronto geography there. And then uh, the following September, September 2015, um, there was uh, two more males and a, and a female found around uh, Toronto Island. So, um, and there's a great little video, we're not gonna show it now, but um, it is on the, um, I think it's in the video gallery of asiancarp.ca, if you go check the resources there, just talking a little bit about, you know, that, that, uh, that, that process that was triggered back in 2015 and 16. Um, next slide, please, Rebecca. Great. So, in terms of the the monitoring and surveillance, obviously, since the you know discovery or finding those those five Asian carp uh, or grass carp grass carps rather, we've been actively surveying the Toronto waterfront um, 2016 to now in partnership with uh, First Fisheries and Oceans Canada as well as you know the the collaborators as part of um, you know the Asian Carp uh, Initiative. Um, and uh, again, won't go into in too much detail, but again, another video um, we, we put out actually very recently um, really talks about what it's like a day of the life of, of um, you know, monitoring crew uh, with TRCA uh, searching for Asian carp and talks about, you know, the, the different types of nets that are used from the trammel net, trap night, uh, fight net, as well as, um, you know, some just general education. So uh, the, the, the video, will, we'll, we'll try to put that in the video gallery as well for anyone who is uh, interested in checking, checking it out. Um, yeah, next slide, please, Rebecca. Great, getting to, I guess, the meat of really what, what we're focusing on at least today's presentation is the outreach and education side of, um, of, of Asian carp. So <laughs> don't be surprised, it's a bit of this like, you know, night and day of, of, of how we've, change things up given given COVID but you know pre prior to March 2020 um, there's a variety of different you know in-person programs and events um, that, uh, that 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 we, we ran at TRCA um, you know focusing on Asian carp and integrating various outreach and education so you know one example there was uh, quite a, a comprehensive resource kit education resource, resource kit that we developed and used for you know school programs and events it include all sorts of things like props and teaching tools and you know um, fun little for those who are familiar with the Plinko game, you know, you drop a little marble down and it has to go find a path to a least resistance. And we sort of turn that into a into a, an illustrative, you know, mechanism to try to tell the story of of of, of Asian carp and the different um, approaches that we are using um, collectively to try to, um, you know, address that threat. So again, trying to, you know, translate and, and, and communicate some 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 technical knowledge in a fun, playful way that that uh, kids and students can help understand. So anyways, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot the resource kit involved a lot of those type of, uh, you know, activities and props, that sort of thing, as well as curriculum linked uh, resources. We also, it's funny, Tommy Thompson Park, like I said, uh, you know, Asia, Asian carp and carp in general has been, has been a big talking point for all sorts of different themed nature walks. We actually experiment with a, a carp focused nature walk, you know? Not knowing how that would go over, but it, it went over really well. There was actually a lot of interest in it. Um, we do we do have some pretty cool features to to talk and help tell that story at Tommy Thompson Park, including cart gates. You can see a picture of it in the slide there. Um, you know to keep out obviously uh, common carp as well as Asian carp um, from um, from some of the different wetlands that, uh, that 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 we've helped to restore. So there is a fun video again. If you're interested, we can uh, share that link 
but uh, but again, a great a great sort of site to help tell the story of of, of Asian carp and and really get at some of those audiences that Rebecca mentioned in terms of anglers and great people who are connected to Great Lake communities as well as uh, ethnic uh, ethnic communities. And then last but not least, the uh, Asian carp fact sheet, which which you know we we developed in collaboration with partners and and uh, DFO um, to to help just share widely and and, and help really um, help those who may come across Asian carp know what to do and how to identify and whatnot. So, anyways, next slide, please, uh, Rebecca. This brings us to post 2020 and and how we sort of along with pretty much everyone else and you know pivoting and really thinking of how we 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 we, we take this work and and and, and transition to a, a virtual environment. So largely we we've been focusing a lot on short videos um, and sharing them through you know social media. One of those that I mentioned in in regards to the day in the life of you know a TRSA monitoring crew to to try to look at how the work in the field is actually happening. So definitely encourage uh, people to check that out if you're interested. And again, all that's driving these, these users to this fact sheet so that we can, you know, sort of ensure that the, the, the information is getting communicated, um, you know, uh, as widely and, 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 and comprehensively as possible. What we've tried to do also is experimenting with different activity worksheets. So again, thinking about how we actually provide an even more engaging experience while tuning into a video, um, particularly for school groups and, 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 and parents with kids who may be in a homeschooling environment, how we can provide a tangible, you know, um, you know, activity to accompany that video. So we've experimented with that, which which has, has gone over um, fairly well. Um, we've we've also hosted family friendly Asian carp um, webinars, right? So the idea of really looking at at the issue from the perspective of um, you know a, you know a younger age level and how we think about you know making it meaningful and and also how do we build capacity amongst educators so that they have the tools and resources they need to hopefully build in this messaging into future uh, you know lessons and and um, and various engagement opportunities because again the benefit of working in a virtual environment is it does provide this you know body of work that can be reused and and, and referred to and then last but not least these curriculum like YouTube live streams integrating Asian carp we've, we've been having a really fun time experimenting with these and all all it is is in essence sort of you know a type of you know, virtual field trip, let's say, although it's live, so that students, um, you know, uh, uh, across the province or anywhere can tune in, um, and 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 it's focused on particular grade levels in this case. So we, you see a screenshot there of one that we hosted last week for grade sevens, focusing on um, ecosystems, and and took the opportunity to integrate Asian carp and tell that story with some great feedback actually from teachers and students and, and 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 some great dialogue so because this is all curriculum linked in that sense it does provide the opportunity like i said for some capacity building with various teachers and and whatnot and, and again we're, we're seeing some great traction on these videos with you know a thousand shares through the you know the the, the short video but monitoring i mentioned with lots of great um uh shares amongst various local based uh, fishing organizations and um and and similar with these youtube live streams so um, yeah, just trying to to see what we can do to to to, to get the message out as broadly as possible in a in a virtual environment. Uh, next slide, please, Rebecca. It's okay. The next slide, actually, it, it's it's yeah. There we go. It's just providing our, our contact information. Encourage you all to to um, if you're interested, follow up with with us in these hat handles. You can see you know this content that I've mentioned, as well as a lot of the other content that we're you know um, that we're helping to to share. Um, but, uh, but again, thanks again for tuning in today and uh, looking forward to continuing to, to work with this exciting partnership. So have a great day. We'll be available for questions if there are any. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. And last but not least, Brooke. Hopefully you guys can see me okay and hear me okay. Yep. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for joining in everybody. So as uh, Rebecca said, my name is Brooke Schreier. And I am the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the Invading Species Awareness Program. So before we jump into some of the you know, meat and potatoes of my presentation, I wanted to focus a little bit on who we are so you guys have a better understanding of, of who the organization is and, and who the program is uh, that I work for. So the OFAH is the largest nonprofit uh, charitable and fish and wildlife conservation organization in Ontario. We actually started in 1928 as the Ontario Federation of Anglers. And then in 1947, two like-minded uh, organizations came together, um, Hunters and Anglers, to form what is now known as the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And if you're not familiar with our organization, we do fundamentally focus on the enhancement of opportunities for fishing, hunting, and trapping. Um, and in so doing, we encourage safe and responsible participation 
Um, and through our work, we really do ab advocate for conservation of our natural resources, right? We need to understand that our natural resources are fundamental to the future of outdoor recreation um, in the form of hunting, angling, and trapping. Um, so fundamentally, really focused on the sustainability of our natural resources. So if you'd like to visit our website, you can go to www.ofah.org. Next slide, please, Rebecca. So then within the OFH, we actually have four conservation programs. And the ISAP, or the Invading Species Awareness Program, is the, the oldest and uh, longest standing uh, program that we have at the OFAH. It was started in 1992 as a partnership between the OFAH and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, really, it started once you know zebra mussels got into Ontario uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and you know there was a there was a recognition that we had to start educating Ontario's public about these invasive species so that they could help in the prevention uh, of these of these uh, the movement and the introduction of these invasive species to other water bodies. So through that, we've really focused on generating education and awareness since 1992. And we focus on pathways for introduction and or spread. So things like the boater pathway through various programs. Uh, we, we did originally really focus in on aquatics, but then now have expanded our education and outreach to a terrestrial and, and aquatic invasive species. We also facilitate monitoring and early detection. So early detection in the form of the invading species hotline. So 1-800-563-7711 and the online platform and application for your phone, uh, EdMaps, so the early detection and distribution mapping system. So if you were to encounter what you suspect is a, is a grass carp, let's say, in Ontario's waters, uh, you snap a photograph, and then you either call the hotline or you, you log on to, to EdMaps to submit a report. That Those things then come to us and then we, we facilitate um, getting that information to, to partners and people who need to know. Um, so in, in terms of surveillance control and response, we really do focus on um, two core things because most of our work is focused on education and outreach. Um, water soldier eradication is one of those. So that is an invasive aquatic plant, real nasty. Um, if you've never if you've never encountered it before, it was found in the Trent Severn Waterway in 2008, and uh, we've been working with partners to try to eradicate that uh, that plant from Ontario for a number of years now, um, with some really great success. Uh, and then finally, with Asian carps, really participating in that early detection piece, wherein if a report comes to us, then we know, okay, well, let's get that information to people who need to know, and you'll see a little more of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So just putting face uh, to the name, there are some people missing here, unfortunately. Uh, we have three new staff, but I haven't seen them because they've been hired uh, during during the pandemic, during COVID. And so that's, that's Jordan, uh, Matthew, and Riley. And uh, like I said, unfortunately, the pictures aren't here. But we have Allison on the top left, who's actually on maturity leave right now. Uh, we have Sophie, our coordinator. We have Rob McGowan on the top right, who's our uh, management technician who focuses on water soldier. That's that nasty plant that I was talking about that he's holding right there. Uh, we have Chase Gando, who's our communications liaison in the, in the bottom left, uh, doing some work with one of our other conservation programs. And then you have myself down in uh, Chicago back in 2017 with some of the partners they have on the line here when we were able to, to catch some of those Asian carps. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can imagine, um, Becca mentioned the gap analysis that was done before. And even before the, the gap analysis was done, uh, ISAP and the OFH has always recognized that there are a number of uh, demographics that need to be targeted with AIS and TIS related information, right? So the people that are on the landscape, the people who are, are going from point A to point B, who may not be going through any form of decontamination with their you know, recreational gear may be spreading uh, these invasive species. So we really have tried to hone in on those those key demographics, including you know anglers, boaters, trail users, um, hunters, anglers, uh, the horticultural trade. You know, you name it. We've we've done some work to uh, to engage with those those different demographics to try to encourage them to learn how to identify invasive species, but then also learn what steps that they can take to then prevent those species from spreading around the province. Uh, next slide, please. Pre-COVID, um, you would have, you know, seen us at various trade shows. Uh, we went to about six or seven every year, including the Toronto Sportsman Show, Ottawa Sportsman Show, uh, as well as many others. And we would always have our, our Asian carbs booth there with uh, all sorts of specimens and resources, uh, really just trying to engage one-on-one -on -one with the public and trying to, to kind of, you know, show them, you know, these are the things that we're dealing with in the province. 
Uh, these are the things that we're, we don't have yet. So let's all do what we need to do in order to make sure that we have our eyes on the water, that we can recognize the potential invasive species when we see it. So then we know well enough to, to report it to the people who need to know. Um, then we've also done a lot of uh, classroom outreach. Again, pre-COVID, that would have been in the classroom, but now it's, it's virtual. And uh, Jordan, who, who works with us, is actually working on adapting that curriculum for, for virtual classrooms. Um, we also attended the AIS Landing Blitz for, in the, for the last couple of years. In 2020, it was virtual. It was still very successful, which was fantastic. Um, we weren't able to get out to the to the landing uh, to the actual landing locations like many of our partners down in the U.S., but we were able to have a, a very strong virtual presence. And then, as Becca also mentioned, and a few others mentioned, we have this this new fact sheet from the invasive grass carp or lookalike, which we we've, we've worked on, and we actually sent it out as an e-blast to all OFAH members. So with about uh, an open rate of I think uh, 30 to 40 percent, which is pretty high in terms of emails. Um, and then that actually led to, to various uh, radio interviews and, and other uh, similar media outreach. Um, so next slide, please. So Chase Gando, who is our communications uh, liaison, does fantastic work at, at generating some of the social media um, that, we, that we put out there related to, to Asian carps or grass carp more specifically. As you can see on the far right, we also do uh, what we can to, to share the posts of, of partners like the Toronto Region and Conservation Authority. So when we see these things, uh, Chase is always uh, on the ball and make sure that those resources are getting shared so that that, that reach becomes that much greater within, within the province, right? Uh, next slide, please. And as I alluded to, with the media reach, we do everything we can to uh, reach out to newspapers and reach out to, to radios and, and really get that information out there as much as we can. We want people to we want to raise that profile for, for Asian carbs. You know, we don't have any established populations in Ontario's waters, and we want to keep it that way. And the best way that we do that, again, is through teaching people how to identify so that when the time comes, they know how to report. And uh, then subsequently, partners can do what they need to do to get those uh, fish out of our waters. Uh, next slide, please. So now I want, to, I want to speak real briefly about the actual tools that are provided to the province for reporting these invasive species. I've, I've alluded to them, but I figured I would I'd focus in a little bit more. So with the invading species hotline it is Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, historically, we, we average about a thousand phone calls a year. Um, however, in 2020, we've received upwards of about 1500 now. Um, so it's a fairly substantial increase and it really did fundamentally have to do with uh, just the nature of 2020. It was a very strange year for a lot of people, um, especially in the invasive species world. We had the Asian hornets scare, uh, so everybody within the province seemed to be reporting Asian hornets. Um, we also had a really bad year for gypsy moths, which are uh, an invasive insect in, in Ontario. Um, it was a, a kind of a boom year for them, so we had a, a number of calls related to, to that. And then as well, just people being on the landscape, right? Uh, with COVID, uh, you know, it's a little silver lining, but a lot of people were really, you know, going out into their yard, gardening, um, going for, for trail walks and things like that. And then in so doing, noticing these invasive species and then subsequently reporting them to us. So on to the next reporting tool, we have the, the EDMAP system. So we're the detection and distribution mapping system. It is an application as well as a web page. Um, and in 2020, um, this number is slightly out of date, but we actually had 2002. Uh, reports come in that were vetted and then released. Um, so those are, those are reports that come to us. We then take the opportunity to look at them, uh, make sure that they are what they were identified as before they're released to the public. Because the last thing we want is people to be downloading that data to use in you know whatever they want to use it for, but finding that there's actually inaccuracies or uh, misidentified species. So we make sure that it's always identified correctly, either in-house or via uh, using experts to identify uh, the species. And then new to a uh, couple of years now, I guess, is the iNaturalist project. So invasive species in Ontario, if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, it's a great um, web page for people, naturalists to go on, submit photos and have them ID'd by the community. And this project was started, like I said, in 2018, and to date has almost 70,000 invasive species reports. And our project itself has over 450 members. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to give you guys kind of an idea around uh, the Asian Carp Protocol, so to kind of connect the dots around, you know, what happens when somebody calls the the invading species hotline. One of the most important things is is that photograph, right? Because there are a number of lookalike species in Ontario that exist. Common carp is the one that gets identified, misidentified the most. Uh, people think it is one of the Asian carps, which you know, as we all know, it is not. It is not one of the four. Um, so that's why photos are so fundamentally important 
So, you know, following this flow chart, you can, you can understand the, the line of thinking as to, okay, when, when do we contact partners? When do we not have to contact partners? And what are the next steps? Um, so, you know, when we do have a suspicious call that comes in, that information is collated, it, it's then subsequently passed on to our partners. And then uh, Rebecca, if you can change the slide, you can see the outcome of some of these phone calls. Um, so in, in terms of total phone calls for Asian carps, we had about 41 in uh, 2020. And actually this is great news because in the past, it, it always seemed to be, be reported as Asian carps. Um, it, I think the education was a little bit uh, less, you know, it wasn't really out there as much, but then the OFH along with all of our partners has ever really been putting work into to identify grass carp as the most imminent threat to our waters in Ontario, right? We're not talking necessarily collectively about Asian carps, we're talking more uh, specifically about grass carp because that's the one species of the four that has arrived in our waters, again, not established, not reproducing, but still it is, it is here. So now we're seeing an increase in people reporting grass carps. Whereas if you'd seen these, these charts, you know, years prior, that, that orange section of the pie would have been much smaller because people were actually identifying them as Asian carps rather than grass carps. So the education outreach seems to be working. Um, so as you can imagine with these, these reports, uh, one was confirmed, one was a grass carp, and that was, you know, sent on to partners. Uh, but the other 40 were actually misidentifications uh, of native fish species or even non-native fish species that we have uh, in Ontario's waters. So one thing I didn't show you, uh, which, I, which I meant to show you, was actually a photo from uh, Lake Gibson, which uh, was the result of a hotline phone call in 2016. Um, somebody had called reporting a grass carp, and then, you know, uh, we got a photo. It was a grass carp, and DFO was out there very quickly, electrofishing, and, and got those fish out of the water. So unfortunately, I didn't include that photo. Um, but it just shows you kind of the line of thinking and, and how people go from seeing something, taking a photo, sending it to us, and then how it, like all that, the next steps occur and uh, how it actually leads to action in, in the field to remove these invasive uh, fish from our waters. So with that, uh, if you guys ever suspect that you've seen an Asian carp, make sure you do snap that photograph, mark your location, and then call 1-800-563-7711. And that's it for me. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so we do have time for questions. If anyone has any, please feel free to type them in the question box. Um, this is the contact info of all of the presenters. So that's up there if you have any questions that you want to follow up on uh, individually. So um, the first question we have is, have any of the organization speakers featured in this webinar considered the use of acoustic fish deterrence as a method to mitigate the spread of Asian carp? Um, I think I might pass that to Alex at Fisheries and Oceans Canada to take the lead on. Sorry, what was the question again? It's um, have any of the organizations considered the use of acoustic fish deterrence as a method to mitigate the spread of Asian carp? Okay. Um, to, my, to my knowledge, we've had a few students uh, who have worked uh, in master's and PhD programs who have looked at how several different deterrents, including acoustics, can prevent fish from migrating from one body of, uh, of water to another. Uh, but to this date, none of them are, are, are used in Canadian waters, uh, to, my, to my knowledge. Uh, but maybe Becky Cudmore, who's the program manager, can provide more insight on that. Uh, yes, hi. Actually, uh, Rebecca, you can remind me of the date, but in early March, there will be another webinar uh, hosted by the Invasive Species Center, which will be discussing a lot of the research that is underway uh, that we're hoping to be able to operationalize uh, once the research is finished. So I would say right now we're in the research stage. It's very promising um, tools. Uh, we're, especially, we're especially interested in the ability of acoustic arrays to a corral fish into an area where we might be able to fish them out. Um, I think setting it up for long-term deterrence, there's obviously issues with um, navigation. So uh, I would I would suggest though coming back in early March and listening to that research presentation to get more details. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Becky and Alex. I was actually going to um, 
plug that after you had answered. So it's on March 3rd, and you can register on our website, www.asiancarp.ca. Um, and there will be like a lot more um, research that we cover, but um, that will definitely be one of them. The next question is, are the curriculum and education kit that Colin discussed online anywhere? I am interested in curriculum and teaching tools to implement in my state. Yeah, I can take that, absolutely. So so yes, yeah, some of them are online for sure. And I encourage you maybe if it's easiest, you can just jot down my email address, which you see on the screen there, colin.love at trc.ca, and I can uh, flip you a more direct link. So, um, you know, the worksheet I mentioned accompanying the video is there, um, and we do have a variety of other, like I said, uh, different registration-based programs that that may be of interest to you. So yeah, please please do follow up directly, and I can I can share some links and and potentially even connect into um, our, our partners on the line here once there is additional material potentially to to share. But thanks for your interest. Thanks, Colin. Um, the next question is for Brooke. You mentioned that you get a lot of reports of. Ontario species, what is the most commonly reported species that is misidentified as a grass carp? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, the most common is, is the common carp, uh, the most common misidentified species, um, so your Cyprinus carpio. But then besides that, there are a few other species that do get misidentified. I'd say the next one in line would be the fall fish. Um, so Ontario's largest uh, minnow species, and then you get things like creek chub, uh, essentially any fish that you know may appear like olive green coloration, and especially in, in like with their sizes, uh, you know, relative to to an adult grass carp, they actually have what appears to be kind of larger scales. So when people look at that and you know the coloration, and then the dorsal fin, they kind of say, oh, like this looks like a juvenile grass carp. So I would say those those three are kind of your top ones. So your common carp, your fall fish, and then things like your, your creek chub. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what marketing strategy, being influencer, paid ads, or other, did you find had the most reach for the money spent? Um, I can take a stab at that. And if any partners have anything that they want to add after, feel free. Um, for us, because we've used all three, I think that the most reach you're going to get for the money you spend is definitely using Facebook um, or Twitter. I find Facebook is better because you get more engagement. You might get more impressions on Twitter, but you're not actually getting a ton of comments or likes or retweets where on Facebook you get tons of shares um, and reactions and a lot of comments. Um, and then that gives you the opportunity to engage with the people that are commenting, which is nice. And you do get um, definitely more impressions for what you pay compared to um, when we used Angler's Atlas or influencer marketing. But again, I will say that though we can kind of narrow down our audience using social media, and it's definitely a useful and effective tool, I find a lot of it is um, because people didn't necessarily ask to see this ad, right? We're boosting it and it's kind of like not something that they ask to see. They don't follow us particularly. We don't always get um, we don't always have the best conversations. Sometimes we do, don't get me wrong. Um, and it's a great tool for sure. But I think with influencer marketing, we might pay more for the impressions, but we're definitely getting better engagement. It's people that are already engaged in this content and they want to see it. So um, I just find that they care a little bit more. And um, same with the Anglers Atlas. We don't necessarily get engagements. We don't get to talk to people um, when we're using these angling apps and things like that right now. But um, it's again people that are subscribed to those mailing lists for a reason. So I don't know if anyone has anything to add, but um, that's my opinion. No? All right. Um, the next question is any tips on how to identify an influencer? So I can take that one too. Um, I mentioned that gap analysis that Fisheries and Ocean Canada kind of conducted and we all participated in. Um, that communications firm actually identified. A couple of options so the one that we used was Ashley Ray and, and she was listed on there uh, we wanted to go with someone that was obviously Canadian and focused in and around the Great Lakes and she's from the Ottawa region in Ontario so and she fishes all around the Great Lakes so she was kind of a perfect fit um, and she had a lot of followers and I'm currently working with a couple more that were just recommended to me um, by one of the partners actually um, that he follows. So they're um, 
heavy on in, on Instagram and YouTube. So we reached out to them as well. And again, they, they both have different um, areas of focus. One of them is more focused on Lake Ontario and the other kind of spends more time around Lake Erie, which are two target areas for us. So that's kind of how we, we did it. And, and I tend to, to approach them with, um, I guess the concept and, and what we want to do and the issue at hand. And then I, I kind of turn it over to them to see if they're interested in how we can make it fit with their brand because it is a really serious topic and, and we want to make that clear, but we also don't want to just give people um, content to post. So it's nice to make sure that they can take the content and the seriousness of it and, and fit it with their personal brands um, so that their audience is engaged. And I don't know if anyone else has any other feedback for those two questions. Um, but the next question that we have is what other um, outreach materials do you guys produce um, in terms of like hard copy things, not just digital tools? Um, I can start. We have uh, recently produced some boat rulers. So they're stick on adhesives that we give to anglers to, to stick onto their boats. And when they catch a fish, they can measure how big it is. Um, and on this ruler, it has grass carp identification tips and all the reporting information. So it's kind of like a useful tool for them just in their, on their everyday fishing trips. But then it also benefits us because they have that reporting information and the ID right at their fingertips. Um, and we've also done like floating keychains as well. So they can have them on their boats and the reporting information is on there. Anything that we produce, we try and make sure that the reporting and identification info is on there. Um, do any other partners want to? mention any of their outreach yeah. materials? Yeah, I'll jump in there for sure, uh, speaking. So um, in terms of outreach materials, I mean, if you if you name it, we've probably tried it, whether it's, you know, pens or lanyards or, or what have you. But some of the, the fundamentals that we've always kept are things like uh, signage. So uh, every year we do, we do print runs for uh, either clean drain dry signage to be put up at boat launches or even Asian carp signage uh, to be put up. So, you know, signs are, are kind of a, they're a really good one because they're, you know, kind of passive, right? You, as long as you can get the permission to get them up um, at a boat launch, then you kind of have those passive impressions um, that kind of come like roll in throughout the, the entire year. Besides that, you know, fact sheets and, and guides, we have five different guides uh, based on the different taxonomic groups. Um, so things like fish, uh, aquatic plants, terrestrial plants, uh, forest pests and pathogens, uh, and invertebrates. So, you know, we have a we have a number of resources which can be found at invadingspecies.com. And if you'd actually like any, you can contact me directly. So just send me an email, and what I can do is put together a bundle for you and and, and ship it off to you. Thanks, Brooke. Um, Colin or or Terry, did you guys have any outreach materials that you wanted to mention? Uh, the only thing I'll mention from my end it would be that, you know, separate from outreach, outreach material itself, um, you know, one of the approaches we've tried to use, is, which is common, I think, amongst all the partnerships, is to integrate that existing material, outreach material, whether it's fact sheets or, you know, signs with other events and other initiatives and other programs so that it's a bit of that, you know, cross, um, you know, cross-platform integration so that we're reaching an audience that might not otherwise have been engaged, right? So it's it's more of a strategy than a material hard copy, if you know what I mean, but it's certainly something we're finding is, is helping um, connect some of the audiences we're hoping to reach. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. That's Terry here, and I might just echo uh, what Brooke said. Um, while we want to educate people that are already inclined and are interested, and, and that might include anglers who are already paying a lot of attention to to what they're seeing uh, it's important to uh, hit people uh, when they're at the point of contact or potential contact so signage and uh, even the lanyards and the and the floating keychains for just so it's top of mind when they're at, at the moment and uh, in the place where they might be experiencing these things and and the and when they're launching their boats we've also found uh, that the signage uh, approach is something that we should uh, we'll keep after Thanks, Terry. Um, the next question is, where did you get the cool carp costume? And I know, Terry, that was in your slides. Um, but if I'm right, I believe that that would be Captain Carp from the OFH. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, holy man, that was ago that I that I worked on that project. Uh, that was when I first started. And 
sorry, Brooke, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Can, how about now? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I believe that company specifically was down in the US. Um, I cannot for the life of me recall the actual name of it, but for whoever asked the question, if you'd like to just send me an email, I can get the, get the name for you. But yeah, that is indeed uh, Captain Carp, and he was created about six years ago. Um, and yeah, he's been to a number of events, but I will tell you right now that wearing that costume, uh, as often as it is, may be one of the most uncomfortable things you will ever do. Uh, if anybody else on the line has ever worn a mascot outfit, it's not very comfortable. But it's great. It, it attracts the kids, and then when the kids come over, you can talk to them and the parents. So it's uh, pretty awesome. Obviously, not when COVID's happening, but, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Brooke. Um, okay, and the last question that we have time for, and again, if you have any others, um, our contact info is right there, so please feel free to send any of us an email or, uh, and we can connect you with, with the answer. Um, the last question I think will be for Alex or Becky, and that is, where else could Asian carps threaten Canadian freshwater systems? Alex, do you want me to jump in? Um, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, I wasn't sure if you were on. Go ahead, Alex. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that Asian carp, uh, the, the water temperature preferences are, are very variable, and, and Asian carp species are, are very adaptable. So in terms of where these species could threaten Canadian freshwater systems, it's, it's it's really most of Canada and, and most of North America where where these fish uh, can threaten our systems. And if anybody's interested in seeing some of the habitat modeling we've done, uh, it's color coded where red would mean suitable habitat. And um, spoiler alert, the uh, map of North America is nearly entirely red. So most of Canada is at risk. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so that's all the time that we have for today. So thank you, everyone who tuned in and listened to our presentation. And thank you again to all of the presenters for taking time out of their very busy schedules to present today. Um, just a reminder to please fill out the survey if you have a minute. And um, we would really appreciate any insight or feedback that you have. Uh, you can check out our website for updates and the recording of this and you can visit invasivespeciescenter.ca to see any future invasive species related webinars so thank you again and take care everybody <laughs>